studios somewhere far, far away. will suffer the annual humiliation that is St. Valentine's Day. Now here is a standard Valentine, but the author has made one classic mistake. See if you can spot it. Dear Helen, I love you. Yours sincerely, Rob Newman, flat 19, 19 <laughs> Hollywood Lane, London, W87PJ. Daytime tell, 589. <laughs> Your ref. Now, <laughs> tradition demands that the Valentine sender should remain anonymous, or almost anonymous. Your identity should be tantalisingly shrouded in mystery. Dear Helen, I love you. Yours sincerely, Nob Ruman. <laughs> Flat 19, 19, London, W8, 7 p Yes, yes, yes. Although, on the other hand, you shouldn't get too cryptic. Dear Helen, I love you. Yours sincerely, Flange of Baboons in Mining Country, perhaps, 3, 6. <laughs> One way of smoothly suggesting that it was you is to casually drop in one of the lines that was written on the Valentine card when you next meet on some veranda three months later. Although one has to be careful about which line. You know, Helen, this summer night may be many things, but it isn't sold in aid of the Notting Hill Housing Trust. <laughs> All right. Still, it could have been worse. You know, Helen, this summer night may be many things, but it isn't Rob Newman, flat 19. <laughs> it is also imperative to post your Valentine card from a different postal area than your own. I'm standing here in Baghdad. There aren't any bloody post boxes left. <laughs> One of the worst aspects of Valentine's Day are the messages that crop up in the tabloids and local press. Poodles, you're my dimply pimply squiddly idly, <laughs> Mr. Toasty. Rolo. Huge hugs and smackaroonies, your fun bundle, JJ. Mark, piss off. <laughs> if you look at the top ten best-selling books in Britain, the chances are that most of them are diet books. There's the hip and thigh diet, trim that waist, Kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> and the latest bestseller, How to Get £3.99 Out of a Gullible Gut Bucket. <laughs> the culture of vanity has reached its apex in the United States. Americans spend a fortune on facelifts to look younger. And if you're rich enough, you can qualify for your free bus pass and still find it hard to get served in a bar. Often in cosmetic surgery, they have to graft skin from other parts of the body, so the average middle-aged American in the shower looks like a slice of Battenberg cake. <laughs> Mind you, people are still unwilling to admit to it. Michael Jackson still denies he's had plastic surgery, despite the fact that if you compare these two photos, <laughs> you do tend to notice that he started off looking like a black American and now looks like a Jerry Anderson puppet that's been left too near a radiator. <laughs> We come now to grey hair. Most men are so vain that when they find a grey hair, they pull it out. Sometimes with appalling consequences. <laughs> now, even worse is baldness. But there is a solution to baldness. And the solution is, at some time when you're in your teens or twenties, have all your own hair cut off and have it made into a wig. At that age, it'll grow back. Then, when you hit 50 and go bald, you just put it on and you can truthfully say, it's my own hair. <laughs> the only snag with this is that your hairstyle will be stuck permanently where it was when you cut your hair off. So, people going bald now will probably have had their hair cut off sometime in the early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, one major...
major problem with baldness is that it is hereditary. So one fears for Suzanne Charlton. <laughs> Crime Stoppers is looking for a dangerous criminal wanted in connection with a series of very violent crimes. The man in his late 20s has a moustache and very long hair. He also wears glasses and a black bomber jacket style bomber jacket. He is known in the underworld as No Trousers Jackson. He is not a master of disguise. Keep out of his way as he is known to carry a gun, which... <laughs> If you have any information about this crime, you could win a community action trust. <laughs> Often, when I'm talking to someone I don't know, I mean to say one thing, and what actually comes out is something else altogether. Like when I met Bob Champion, I wasn't sure whether to call him Mr. Champion or just plain Bob, got a bit nervous, a bit flustered, and ended up calling him Mr. Cancer. <laughs> Conversation with someone you don't know very well is very difficult, particularly ending one. Well, of course, it's built for the car, isn't it? You know, we only have a single garage, unfortunately, but there are houses in Hitchin with double garages. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, many times we thought of extending, but in fact, we decided to have some stone. <laughs> Instead, you know, all local stone looks marvellous. You know, reds and greys and greens, but you want to try and keep up the garage. Hitchin, don't you? Yes. Well, of course, it used to be a very historic town, you know. It used to be a... <laughs> I think it was called in those days. And we still have a legacy from some of those periods. I was market on Wednesday afternoon. You can get quite a few pence off supermarkets. Another problem is that in these conversations, you become hyper aware of your facial expression while you're listening. And this becomes particularly difficult as you have to keep changing expression to maintain the pretense of interest. Well, it was a wife's sister, actually. She said, why not move from Hitchin? You know, it's not what it was. I said, move from Hitchin? I had the very thought of it. I just couldn't envisage that happening, really. No, anywhere else. Feels like a fraud to me. We did once take a caravan holiday down to Hatfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know quite where you are in that particular place. It's a terrible business, really. I lost the wheel in North Mead. I feel terrible. <laughs> Interestingly, it's a historical fact that despite everything else, the elephant man, John Merrick, had a set of perfectly formed genitals. Unfortunately, they were on his head. <laughs> then, there are those people who insist on saying what they think others are about to say before they've said it. Hello, Timmy. <laughs> How are things? Fine, thanks, Johnny. <laughs> this is a lovely bit of lettuce. Yum, yum, yum. I think the reason that people do this is because they have a neurotic fear of what might otherwise be said. Hello, Timmy. How's things? Fine, thanks. You're a bit sad now that all you do is voiceovers for Winner Lot adverts. <laughs> uh, of course, you do meet real people like this at parties. Hello. What do you do for a living? I'm an accountant, John. <laughs> Calumny, that is interesting. And what do you do at the weekend? I put my knob in some butter. <laughs> Would you like to sleep with my wife, Johnny? Oh, yes, thanks. <laughs> Hang on. Were you just about to call me a slag? You slag! Right, that's it. <laughs> The most important thing about exams is to find out when they are, as this enables you to work out which of your friends have exams that finish after yours do, so you can invite them to parties that they can't go to because they're still revising. <laughs> Beware, however, that some of them may still turn up and revise at the party. There is no worse party pooper than the bloke who turns up and tries to get everyone to dance to his linguaphone conversational German tape. <laughs> Hören Sie zu und dann wiederholen. Ich gehe nach dem Fenster. Was ist du das? Du gehst nach Jetzt dem Fenster. Good beast. <lacht> Hören Sie zu.
Do not be swayed by the great myths about exams. Everyone has heard the apocryphal stories. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. It was absolutely incredible because he went in, right? And the question was, is this a question? Yeah, right. And he wrote, if this is an answer. You know, the incredible thing is that he failed completely. <laughs> well, that's incredible, yeah, because I had this friend right, who took a three and a half hour paper, and all he did was he went in and he just wrote his name at the top of the paper and he walked out. Oh, God. And the incredible thing was that he got the highest mark ever recorded at Santa. <laughs> now, now, in an exam situation, it's essential that you plan your time. If you do this properly, a three-hour paper should go like this. 9 a.m. Into exam room, turn over paper. Realise you are in the wrong room. <laughs> 9.05. Arrive in correct room. Complete silence. 9.06. You realise you've got to spend the next three hours next to the person with chronic bronchitis. <laughs> oh, 9.07. Turn over paper and read through instructions. Answer at least one question from sections A and C, and either two questions from section B, or one question from section D, and three questions from part two of section B. Do not answer two questions from part one of section A, if you have also answered any one or more questions of sections five to twelve in section D. Sections Q and P are optional for candidates who have answered questions four to seven, but not if you have only answered one part of questions J to K, or part fourteen of section two. Stop writing now, please! <laughs> 9.30. Give up trying to understand instructions. Decide on first question to answer. 9.35. Look around room and panic that everyone else has written more than you. 9.40. Start planning first essay. 9.41. Start writing first essay. <laughs> 9.45. Someone farts and everybody starts giving <laughs> 10 o'clock. 200 digital watches make horrid beeping. 10.05. The hardest person in the class walks out early. 10.06, the hardest person in the class is pushed back in again by his mum. <laughs> Twisting the question. This involves turning a question on something you haven't revised into something you have revised. For example, with the question, write a character study of Hamlet which shows his indecision, examiners are used to receiving answers like this. In order to fully explore the character and indecision of Hamlet, it is first necessary to consider that had Hamlet been Scottish, <laughs> his situation would have been very similar to that of Macbeth. <laughs> Sheer genius. Of course, once your exams are over, there are only two things left to do. The first is to go around saying to all your friends, Oh God, I've just done really badly, but you know, I didn't do any work. <laughs> and the next thing is to go through the paper with your friends, only to discover, Oh God, I have done really badly. <laughs> Oh, I did loads of work as well. <laughs> the best era for films was the silent one. They should never have stopped making films in that way. Most porn films are made in German or Dutch in 1973 and are then dubbed by very bad non-equity members going, hey, you're a tasty chick, or say, this is an office lunch break with a difference. <laughs> However, if their budgets were half the size of Big Johnny Holmes, God rest his soul, then they could afford big stars for the dubbing. <laughs> Mrs. Robinson, this is an office lunch break with a difference. I told you to think so, Woody. Watch out for I'm gonna shoot up in my trousers. <laughs> and it's hello for me. 
Hey, sexy lady, how about I help you out down there? I don't half love your tits, baby. Oh, do you, Johnny? There is, of course, one other great film style of the past that should have been hung on to. Quantus never crashed. Quantus never crashed. Definitely never crashed. Mr. Babbitt, yeah. you've never met uh, your brother, you. but... Uh, <laughs> well, tell him yourself, Raymond. Oh, tell him yourself, Raymond. Yeah, definitely, definitely tell him yourself. Don't you know I'm autistic, be realistic, but I got a good head for statistics. His best friend is an oven mitt. Turn on the shower and I'll have a fit. <laughs> Major have obviously got a great relationship going there. I mean, he lives at number 10 and she lives in Huntingdon. But I felt, I felt Maggie was more sexually motivated. I mean, that's why Dennis looks like he does, despite the fact that he's only 26 years old. <laughs> the reason that couples are always arguing is that you lose interest in having sex with each other after about two days, and then there's nowhere to go. It is a statistical fact that couples argue more about where to go of an evening than about anything else. And each member of the couple will always refuse to make the decision. Now, thankfully, not all decisions about where to go are made in this way. Monsieur! Now, Charing, here is the map of Europe. I think, first of all, we should invade Poland. Ah, Poland. You don't like Poland? No, 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 Poland is fine. You know, I had been thinking, well, we always invade Poland. Maybe Czechoslovakia for a change, but no, 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 you, that's fine. No, I don't mind. If you want to invade Czechoslovakia, we can invade Czechoslovakia. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, going, I'd rather invade Czechoslovakia myself now, because I know if we go to Poland, you're just going to be miserable the whole time. <laughs> oh! One thing I've noticed about long-term relationships is that as time goes on, you become less and less inhibited in each other's physical presence. It's probably just as well this doesn't happen earlier on in relationships. Hello, yeah, Donna, that's right, it's Dave, yeah. I met you the other day. I just wondered if you wanted to come round to my place and, like, clean your teeth while I have a dump. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're already going round to Steve's to fart under the duvet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I recently just split up with my girlfriend and I still don't understand what it's all about because I asked her why and she said, you are completely immature, period. And I said, <laughs> The best representation in our culture of the long-term relationship is, of course, Simon Bates' Our Tune, which is presently under threat of being axed. So I'd like everyone watching to write to Radio 1 and say how much they like it because it does cheer me up every day to hear a laughable catalogue of personal disaster. I particularly like the ones about a woman, let's just call her Linda, and Linda has a baby, and yeah, the baby was very ill, and yeah, six months later it died, and then on the way to the funeral, the hearse crashed and all her relatives died. And then Linda thought nothing else could go wrong, but then her boyfriend got cervical cancer, and then there was a minor nuclear accident underneath her settee. But one thing has kept Linda going throughout all this, and that shut up of your face by Joe Dolce. The big advert against long-term relationships has got to be your present generation of 45 to 60-year-old parents People who went on to be parents in the 1970s seem to have had their own wedding ceremony. Do you, Victor Charles Norton, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. And do you promise after four or five years to stop having sex with her <laughs> and then build up a large collection of pornography in your bedroom drawer? <laughs> and you promise to make a last-ditch attempt to revive it all in 1973 by taking a series of Polaroids of each other naked? Polaroids so ghastly they are turned down by Fiesta Reader's wife. I do. And do you, a Maureen Margaret Corby, promise to buy some padded Terraline slacks and to wear them all the time? I do. And you promise to say something mind-bogglingly stupid every day, but always follow it with a little smile of self-congratulation? No. <laughs> of course I do. I ask you both, do you swear for three days of every month to be not talking to each other? <laughs> Good. And lastly, 
Hardly do you swear in 1971 to buy a plastic three-piece sweet so garish that not even Honey Bear would have it in his apartment. <laughs> we do. <laughs> So if we keep disobeying this rule, is some terrible punishment going to be sent upon us? And it came to pass that he looked down upon the world he had created, and he saw that, lo, on the Sabbath there was much mowing of lawns, and much purchasing of barbecue equipment from Texas home care. <laughs> but Noah did no work upon the Sabbath, for, lo, he watched the East Enders omnibus, and fell asleep even until Antiques Roadshow. And the Lord spoke to him, saying, Noah, I command you to build an ark of oak and cedar wood. And Noah replied, saying, Crikey, I'll have to nip down to Texas Home Care and buy a new hammer. <laughs> Later on in the show, we'll be asking, was Jesus really a carpenter? Throughout this series, we have had complaints about swearing. So from now on, we will employ specific code words. So when we say chuff or chuffing, we mean the F word. And for the C word, we will use the phrase Henry Kelly. <laughs> Although this may lead to some confusion in, for example, the sentence, Henry Kelly, what a Henry Kelly! <laughs> of course, normally, swearing is covered in broadcasting by the beep. But I think eventually this just begs the question, you know, what is Roadrunner actually saying? <laughs> there is, however, the word that is worse than any of these. All right, hi, I'm Terry Christian. All right, great. Stop a nonsense, stop a nonsense. All right, stop a nonsense. Oh, that's great. That, all right, right, okay. Stop the nonsense. But first of all, Amanda. <laughs> There are a number of things about the Gulf War that have been left unsaid. First of all, the Allies are employing carpet bombing. So that's Allied carpet bombing. <laughs> Hundreds of Iraqi missile sites must go. <laughs> yeah, and like the ecologists are saying that we can't bomb the Iraqi oil fields because, they say, it would turn Iraq into a desert. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're really going to miss their prize-winning marrows. <laughs> but thankfully, it looks like Iraq's going to lose, you know, which is good, because if they won and took over here, you know, people would be forced to adapt to the Iraqi way of life. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is that in Iraq, everyone has their surname first. So Saddam is actually Hussein Saddam's surname. So if they won, we'd have Davis Dickey, do Scooby and Large Eddie and Little Sid. I remember shortly after the uh, war broke out, the BBC took Neighbours off the air, and I think this is because the acting in Neighbours is so bad, it looks as though the entire cast has been captured by the Iraqis and made to say those lines. <laughs> and then, of course, they took off Dad's Army. Now, a lot of people couldn't understand this, but what they don't realise is that some episodes of Dad's Army can be construed as relevant to what has happened in the Gulf. Now look here, Wilson, you listen to me. I don't care what the verger says. I think we should invade Kuwait. <laughs> You're awfully sure that's wise. <laughs> of course, Dad's army is back on now. But we think not only should it be on, it should be an integral part of the coverage. Over now live to the Pentagon briefing room for a quick report from Captain Stormin Mannering. <laughs> now simmer down, everybody. Simmer down. If you look at this screen, you will see film of an attack on an Iraqi missile launcher. This box here in the top right-hand corner is Corporal Jones. <laughs> you will move towards the target, shouting, they don't like it up em. <laughs> you will then destroy the target using a hand-operated, radar-guided, highly explosive smart bomb which was knitted by Godfrey's sister, Dolly.
However, the Dad's Army decision is still under attack from some MPs for spreading alarm and despondency. Hello. Well, on tonight's news night, we are joined by George Harvey, Professor of Strategic Studies at Sheffield University, Mr. Andrew Sharrock, founder and so far sole member of Sun Journalists for Disarmament, and <laughs> Private Fraser. The refinery <laughs> is leaking, leaking, oil spilling everywhere. <laughs> Hundreds of cormorants doomed. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Sharrock. Now, what do you think, Private Fraser? <laughs> Dogs hold the same place in British affections as guns do in America's. You can buy them really easily, you shouldn't need a licence, and they both kill people. <laughs> the only difference is that a 45 Magnum doesn't crap on the pavement afterwards. <laughs> it's not dogs I like dislike so much as a certain type of dog owner. And more than anything, I hate that sticker that you see in the backs of people's cars that says, CAUTION! SHOW DOGS IN TRANSIT! As if you're going to say, DAMN! I was deliberately going to ram into the back of that car. <laughs> well, that thing I'll bother now because they've got SHOW DOGS IN TRANSIT! And you know what SHOW DOGS are? Those horrible quaffered pooches that ponce up and down at Crufts. What I really hope is that when those Crufts dogs go down the park, the other dogs instead of sniffing round their arse, just beat them up. Because <laughs> they deserve it. I mean, suppose all dogs behave like that. Come on, boy, there's two climbers lost in this snowdrift, so have a blow-dry and then jump onto this box. <laughs> the only car sticker even more aggravating than show dogs in transit is the one that says, Caution, I slow down for horses. <laughs> what choice have you got if a horse walks in front of your car? It's like saying, Caution, I slow down when I reach the back wall of my garage. <laughs> Now, we can't go much further here without mentioning Rottweilers. These are becoming more and more popular with all social groups. This photo <laughs> was taken at Ascot in 1980, and coincidentally, no one has seen Shergar since. <laughs> the problem with Britain is that it hasn't got any really scary animals. America has bears and alligators, Australia's got funnel-web spiders, India's got tigers and cobras, but the most dangerous animal you're likely to encounter here is the adder or a slightly grumpy squirrel. <laughs> grumpy, probably, because Carling Black Label aren't paying him any repeat fees. <laughs> now, this may account for the cosy image of animals that we're brought up with. Who knows what effect it would have on children's perceptions if all those cuddly cartoon animals behaved a bit more like the real thing. Officer Dibble, Officer Dibble, I hope you like the dead bird I have mangled with its entrails all over your doorstep. If they choose you, they'll go and stick up a fur ball all over the carpet. Okay, T.C. Okay, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. Top cat, I've told you not to use the police phone after licking your own genitals. <laughs> I can't marry you, Miss Piggy. Uh, you see, I fertilize externally, and, uh, well, I, I just dribble all over your back. Boom! Boom! I say, God, I... There, that'll be all. Shit, no legs. 